بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ويضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار uh, so we start today inshallah ta'ala uh, a new series of lessons on uh, the creed the aqida of the imam imam at-tahawi rahimahullah and Inshallah ta'ala, I'll first of all give just a brief, very brief biography, a very concise biography of uh, this imam. And so he is uh, known as Abu Ja'far, that is Kunya, Abu Ja'far, Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Salama bin Salama bin Abdul Malik al-Azdi al-Tahawi. It's easy just to, just to remember him as Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi. Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi. And so he used to live in Egypt, in the place called Egypt. And he was born in the year 239 Hijrah. So he was born around the time of the, when, when the great Imams like Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, and Ishaq bin Rahuya, Imam Ahmad died 241 Hijrah. And Ishaq bin Rahuya, he died in the year 238 Hijrah. So he was born at you know, at the time when those imams uh, were present. And he, uh, when he reached a very early, when, when he reached maturity, when he was quite young, in fact, around 10, 11, he uh, went from, or he went to Egypt uh, and to seek knowledge. And so the first, or the, one of the main people that he sought knowledge from was another scholar, called Ismail bin Yahya al-Muzani. Al-Muzani is another great scholar. Al-Muzani used to be a companion of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. So Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he died in the year 204 Hijrah. 204 Hijrah. And al-Muzani rahimahullah was one of the major students of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. Uh, and al-Muzani was his uncle. He was the uncle of Al-Tahawi on his mother's side. So he took knowledge from Al-Muzani. And so it shows that he was brought up in a Shafi'i background. Because Al-Muzani was upon the fiqh of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. So what happened was, as the story uh, goes, that he had some issues which he uh, would discuss with uh, Imam Al-Muzani. And he wouldn't receive satisfactory answers. He wasn't you know, content with the answer on certain issues to do with the ahkam and, and fiqh and so on and so forth. And so what happened is that he went to another person, another scholar, who was a Hanafi, and he found the answer that, that was satisfying and pleasing to him. And some other stories mentioned, some other narrations mentioned that he actually had a dispute with Al-Muzani, and, you know, with respect to a particular issue. And, uh, you know, again, he went to a Hanafi scholar and he went to research the issue into, into the Hanafi books, into the usul of uh, Abu Hanifa and his companion Abu Yusuf on the issues of, of, of fiqh that is. And he found a satisfactory answer. So what happened is that whilst beginning upon the fiqh of a Shafi'i, he changed and adopted the, the fiqh of Abu Hanifa because he found within it that which was satisfactory to him. And so, however, what should be pointed out is that his association with Abu Hanifa wasn't like the, the blind followers that we see who came in the later times. Rather, we see many, there are many, uh, or there, are in, there are narrations and incidents uh, which are mentioned uh, regarding him, how he would uh, stick to the proof. And he wouldn't blindly follow everything that would come from Abu Hanifa and his companions. And this is because uh, in the later times, the followers of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, when they, begin, when they began to write down 
the fiqh rulings and the, the issues of jurisprudence and they began to codify them. They began to use that as the foundation. They began to use that as the foundation. So they made it rigid. And so they would rely back upon the opinions of the scholars. And so eventually, so rather than relying upon the usul, the foundations of what Abu Hanifa was upon, because Abu Hanifa was upon the same uh, uh, usul that the other scholars were upon, it's just that he had very stringent requirements for accepting a hadith. And as a result of that, there wasn't uh, uh, as much a dependence upon the hadith as the other, other scholars had. However, what, what this, so, but in principle, his, his foundations were the same as the, as, as the other scholars. But then what happened in later times, and so as a result of that, there was a lot of ra'i or opinion which would tend to come into uh, this school. But the, those who came afterwards from his followers, they began to rely upon the actual statements and rulings and opinions that came rather than implementing the actual usul that Abu Hanifa himself was upon. So this is how the rigidity and the, 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 the people began to stick blindly to, to, to the Hanafi madhab. So at tahawi wasn't like that. at tahawi was a, a, a great scholar and so he followed the evidence and uh, there's actually a narration here uh, that is mentioned uh, in this regard. Uh, and so basically there's someone discussing the issue of Imam at tahawi they were revising certain issues together, and uh, uh, so one of them said to the uh, so 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 at the how we said to the other person who we were discussing with that uh, this is not the saying of Abu Hanifa, and this person said to him that you know is is uh, is is everything. That Abu Hanifa that, that comes from Abu Hanifa, should I speak with it? Should I should I should I should I stay with it? Should I adhere to it? And so At Tahawi replied to him, I did not consider you to be a muqallid. I didn't I expect you to be a muqallid. So then this man said, And does anyone make taqlid except someone who is a, a, a partisan, someone who has like you know partisanship? And At Tahawi said, Or maybe a ghabi, maybe someone who is foolish. Right, so from this discussion you see that at tahawi wasn't someone who was a blind follower, rather he looked down upon uh, a blind following of the opinions of, of one person in everything. So as for the scholars uh, who mentioned him and spoke in praise of him, there are many statements, but we can mention two or three. From them is the saying of Ibn Yunus, who said, at tahawi was a thiqa thabt. Thiqa thabt is just a, a, like a gradation or a ranking to show that he was uh, firm, reliable, trustworthy, and he was a faqih, aqil, he was someone who was a jurist, was with good understanding, and he never left behind him anyone who was like him. And Imam al-Zahabi, rahimahullah, Imam al-Zahabi, he said about him, al-faqih, al-muhaddith, al-hafiz, he's the jurist, a muhaddith, a narrator of hadith, a hafiz, a memorizer of hadith, and one of, one of, the, one of the most important <coughs> Uh, figures and he was a thiqa, thabt, faqih, aqil again similar, same as before and Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, the one who wrote the tafsir tafsir Ibn Kathir he said that he is one of the re reliable the ahdu thiqat al-athbat that he is one of the uh, trustworthy firmly established firmly grounded uh, narrators and the memorizers of hadith the skilled memorizers of hadith and from uh, the, the teachers that we mentioned, the, the main teacher that we know, Ismail al-Muzani, there was also Yunus bin Abdul al-A'la, and Ar-Rabi bin Suleiman. These are well-known scholars from, from the Salaf. As for his books, he wrote many books, but one of the main books that uh, is well-known is a book called Sharh Mushkil al-Athar, an explanation of the difficult narrations. Of the, of the difficult uh, narrations. And... Uh, so he died in the year 321 Hijra, and he wrote this particular creed, this very brief, concise creed. It is no more than maybe six or seven pages um, long, and it's very, very short, very concise. And what we see from this creed is that it is agreed upon and accepted by all of the people who follow all of the four schools. Um, however, as, as we shall see, inshallah ta'ala, that many of those people who departed and left the aqidah of the Salaf, 
the, the belief of the Salaf, like for example the, the Ash'aris and the Maturidis, these people began to lay a claim and an attachment to Imam al-Tahawi's creed. They began to interpret it in, in a way that was supportive of their creed. So inshallah ta'ala, as we progress through the explanation, uh, the relevant points will be made about that particular uh, issue. And so before we actually, uh, so we're going to we're going to use inshallah ta'ala the explanation of Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan. It is a fairly brief commentary, and we find there are there are many commentaries, quite detailed, quite you know in depth. From them is the the famous commentary by the scholar called Ibn Abil Iz, Ibn Abil Iz al Hanafi, and he was in the eighth uh, century Hijra. So he, de- he wrote a detailed explanation of that. And likewise, in the contemporary times, we find there are many explanations. Uh, we have one here from Sheikh Salih al Sheikh, inshallah, we, which we shall make reference to uh, as and when needed. And likewise, we see uh, many, uh, and, and they vary in length. Some of them, like one explanation we have is, is literally three volumes long. You know, it runs into 1,500 pages. Others run into 500 pages. There are, so we have many different explanations. Some are brief, some are concise. Uh, Sheikh Al-Bani rahimahullah, has like a very brief commentary upon it, maybe 60, 70 pages. We see Sheikh Salih Fawzan's. His spans maybe 250 pages, and then we have some 1,500 pages. So we see that a great deal of concern has been showed uh, to this book, to this creed, from brief commentaries to very detailed commentaries. So, inshallah, what we're going to do is to make the lessons uh, fairly easy and fairly easy going, inshallah. We're going to re- use the explanation of Sheikh Salih al Fawzan as a basis because it's fair, you know, uh, brief, concise, and easy to understand. And as and when needed, we'll rely upon other explanations. We'll have here another book, which is in, actually in three volumes, and this contains the explanation of Sheikh uh, Salih bin Abdulaziz al Sheikh. Likewise, Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, rahimahullah, his commentary upon it. Likewise, Sheikh Al Bani's brief commentary. Likewise, uh, Muhammad bin Abdul Aziz ibn Mani. And uh, so there are, there, are, there are many other commentaries that we have here. If we need to rely upon them, inshallah, we will, we will, we will uh, refer to them. So before we begin, before we dive into the book, so to speak, uh, there is some valuable advice from Sheikh Salih al Sheikh about seeking knowledge, about seeking knowledge and its principles. So inshallah, we'll go through maybe four or five points of benefit that the Sheikh has mentioned, because this will give us an, a, a good understanding as to how we pursue knowledge, how do we acquire knowledge, how do we memorize knowledge, and how do we become rooted in knowledge. And so there are some real valuable benefits here in what the Sheikh is going to say. So the Sheikh says, uh, at the beginning of his commentary upon this book, he says that we shall shall mention here certain affairs that are related to a seeker of knowledge, someone who is a student of knowledge, seeking knowledge, and the manner in which he takes knowledge from other people, from the Sheikhs, from the students of knowledge, how does he take that knowledge? So obviously this relates to everybody sat here, and ourselves likewise. And so he mentions uh, six or seven points. Uh, some of them, uh, we, we'll mention maybe four or five of them because they, 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 they are fairly straightforward. So from them, he says that the first thing that should be noted is that a person should always remind himself, always remember yourself, that knowledge, seeking knowledge, is actually worship. Uh, so talabul ilm is actually ibadah in and of itself. And it is something by which you seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So basically, as sitting here today, this is an act of worship, and it is something by which we seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see that the scholars have mentioned that the greatest of the involuntary deeds of the tatawwa, those deeds which are not from the wajibat, not from the obligatory uh, affairs, that, that the greatest of deeds after them, is actually seeking knowledge. So in other words, after the, 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 the establishment of the prayer, and the fasting, and the zakah, and all of the other wajibat, which, which are waj, wajib upon a person, then after them, the greatest of the deeds which, 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 which are virtuous is actually seeking knowledge. And the shaykh says, in fact, 
Although, although this is a ruling upon knowledge, in many instances, seeking knowledge would actually be wajib upon many of the students of knowledge. Why? Because most of us, many of us, wouldn't really have a, a, a quite sufficient knowledge in order to fulfill the affairs of worship. Or likewise, to, to understand the foundations of his religion, like in the affairs of Tawheed and Aqidah and Iman. Most of us are deficient in that regard. So because of that, knowledge is actually wajib in those areas. So it shows that you know, it, it has a much more uh, you know, important place than what we think it does. And so for this reason, the shaykh says, when you understand this and when you realize this, when you remind yourself that knowledge is an act of worship, it is taqarrub Allah, it is something that brings you closer to Allah, then a person will never become lazy or indifferent to seeking knowledge. Rather, he will have a different attitude towards knowledge. And so, you know, in terms of memorizing, studying, writing, seeking out books and so on and so forth, again, his, his attitude will, will, will change. Uh, so... The Shaykh then goes on to the... He mentions another point that we see that some of the scholars mention that even seeking knowledge, some of the scholars have said that it is even more virtuous than striving in the path of Allah, meaning, meaning jihad. I mean that jihad which is involuntary, uh, sorry, not involuntary, which, which is voluntary, which is uh, at tatawwa uh, which is not, not the one which is farad ain, but the farad kifaya. That it is even more virtuous and superior to that type of, that type of jihad. And the reason is because we see that knowledge has its benefit is something that extends to other people. It extends to other people more so than the benefit in you know striving in the in the path of Allah in terms of the, the, the jihad. So so the general principle is that that whose benefit is more wider and reaches more people, then that has a greater status and it is of greater benefit. And that's why, as we said, the way of many of the scholars who that they stated that seeking knowledge is better and more superior than striving in, in, in the path of Allah in terms of the jihad, which is fard, kifa, uh, fard kifaya, not fard ain. The second principle he mentions then, so the first principle is reminding yourself that ibad, that seeking ilm is ibadah. The second principle he mentions here is that what are the ways of seeking knowledge? Now, practically speaking, what are the ways of seeking knowledge? What he means here is, um, like for example, that you attend the, the gatherings of, the, of the, 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 the sheikhs, the people of knowledge, the scholars, and likewise the, the tulab al-ilm, the, the students of knowledge, and likewise the mu'allimin, those who teach the knowledge, and likewise the person attends, he hears, he listens, and he writes, or maybe he even might record, However, the shaykh says that all of this is not sufficient. That's so far after all of this that you, you know, seek the gatherings of the, 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 the scholars and the shaykhs and the students of knowledge and the teachers and then you attend and then you listen and then you write and then you might even record. At this point, this actually has, is not, isn't, isn't, the, isn't sufficient. He says this is not sufficient. Rather, a person must after this, must study and revise, right? So that's where the studying takes place, right? The studying takes place when you actually study and revise. And you study and revise as if you were going to be tested on the material tomorrow. So he says that what this means is that obviously you, you study, you pay attention to the notes that you've written, and you look at the words that have been used you look at the evidences which have been provided. You arrange and organize things. So you take your notes and you arrange them, organize them. You extract things from them and whatever. And so, um, so all of this is what we call a talaqi. This is what we call the acquisition of knowledge. That's where the acquisition actually takes place. Right? In terms of how you take what you've heard, what you've written, then... You look at it, you revise it, you extract things from it, you organize it, you arrange it, and then you memorize it. And then this is what we call a talaqi You know, this is the actual place where knowledge is, is acquired. So the Shaykh says, so just hearing and writing isn't enough. Alone, they do not really benefit. That you hear and that you write, 
you know, then, then you, you'll leave the room, you'll go away, and by tomorrow afternoon you've forgotten everything, and by next week, you know, you've forgotten everything. You know, so this, this, isn't, this isn't really what seeking knowledge is about. And if you were to ask, like the Sheikh says, after one year, you, know, you probably wouldn't remember anything. But obviously, if we, if, we, if we were to say after a week or a month, then you'd, you'd hardly remember the, the lesson that you had the, the week before or the month before. So the Sheikh says that when you have a, a revision and you return back to your notes, and you, know, you look at the text and you revise, you look at the, 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 the words, and you look at the explanation and the benefits that were given, and then you memorize the proofs, you make note of the proofs, and you go back to those proofs, you read them, and so on and so forth. This is where the actual knowledge uh, is, is, is acquired. And so this obviously is, is very, very important. And we see that most people don't really, this is not, we don't really seek knowledge in this manner, but this is where the knowledge is actually, at how, how it is sought and how it is learnt and how it is conveyed from generation to generation. Uh, then the Sheikh says, and then he actually goes on to mention three steps. He gives us three practical steps. And he says that, okay, we'll mention uh, certain practical steps which a person should be eager to act upon. The first of them is that, um, that first of all, that when you write, that you write with clear writing. That when you're making notes, and when you're writing the benefits, and when you're writing the points that you know the teacher is mentioning, that you write in a very clear, legible writing. Uh, you don't write too small, and you know you you know. So the Sheikh says that. You know, write it in a manner that when you come back to it and you revise it, you're able to able to, to, to read it. And don't worry about paper because there's plenty of paper uh, present in in the world. It says the Wallahi alham. There's plenty of paper paper, so don't worry about papers. So always write clearly. Don't rush so that you, you know when you when you go back, you're not struggling to to you know uh, see what you've written. That's the first thing. Uh, second thing is that you should always strive to summarize whatever you have read or whatever you have written. But so when you've heard a lesson, or when you've written from a lesson, you should come back and write, right. If I was to write, for example, a page summary of all the, the main points that have been mentioned, then you should always start, try to make a talkhis, a summary. Summary of each lesson. So you take your notes and write down, okay, these point one, point two, point three, and so you've made a summary of that lesson. Then when you come back to it, you can refer to that summary rather than refer back to the, the whole lesson. So basically you're always extracting the benefits and making the summary of each lesson that you've, that, that you've attended or that you've heard. And the third thing that the Sheikh mentions here obviously is revision. So whatever you've wrote from the, from the Sheikh or from the student of knowledge, and you, know, you should go back to it and try to uh, uh, memorize the, the main points. Because the Sheikh says that knowledge disappears if you don't pay attention to it. Knowledge disappears. And so if you don't keep to it and attend to it and revise it, and you know, it'll, it'll just, it's just like if you leave your animal, your domestic animal, or you leave a camel, for example, untied, it's going to disappear. This is the nature of knowledge. Likewise, it's, it's the nature of the Quran. The Quran dis disappears from your memory if you don't keep attending to it and revising the memory. The same with knowledge. Same with knowledge of the religion. And so the Sheikh says that we see that there are many books, many foundational books that you know, explain, for example, the Aqidah or Tawheed or other, uh, or other areas. And what we see, a person might just read it once or twice. The Sheikh says what we do is that we read a book 10 or 20 times. Or 10 or 20 times. Why? Because every time we come back to the book, we see a benefit that we didn't see before. So... The point here is that a person shouldn't say, for example, that we see many people saying, oh, that book, yeah, I read that book. I read that book, now I'm on to this book. You know, like we read the book once, now I'm on to the, um, the, the, the other book. We see the difference, you know, that the, that the true and real scholars, they, they actually read a book maybe 10, 20, 30 times. So every time they read it, they might find some other benefit or something that they missed. And every time they go back to the book, they see the benefit, then they'll write that benefit down. Right? It, it wasn't, it's not just casual reading, you sat there, you know, on the sofa lying down, falling asleep maybe or just something to do in the meanwhile you, you pick, pick a book no pen no notes and you're just casual reading to pass the time and obviously as you're reading the benefits are popping up in your mind but come two three hours later it's all gone right so this is not the the type of study and the reading that, that you know that the sheikh 
you know, the Shaykh is saying that when you, when you actually want to study a book, literally you've got to devour that book. As in, you've got to read it once, twice, three, four, five. Each time, you know, you're making more and more notes. So basically, you just, as I said, you're literally devouring the book from every single angle that you think. This is what we call studying. This is what you call, and this is how a person, this is how he learns. This is how the knowledge becomes rooted in him. So the Sheikh says that when you take this approach, uh, when you read the text, when you read the benefits, when you revise, when you read it again, then this is what will, uh, the knowledge will become firmly rooted and established. And, um, you know, so, uh, and he says that when, when, your, when your knowledge is rooted like this, then everything which follows on from it will be the same. So if, so if in your knowledge you're deeply rooted, then everything else that follows on that, that, that in that too you will be deeply rooted. Sheikh mentions here a principle, he says that, that when, when something which is sahih, when, when there's something that's sahih, whatever is built upon it will also be sahih. Whenever a construction is sound, everything else that builds on top of it will also be sound. When something is defective, and whatever is built upon it, that too will be defective. When something is erroneous, is wrong, plain wrong, and whatever is built upon that is also plain wrong. Well, three things he mentions. So for that reason, the Sheikh says that in order to build a sound foundation in terms of knowledge, then the you know a person should really study knowledge in the manner that's described, not treat it like you would read a novel or a book, you know, like like people just for pleasure or whatever. It's actually serious. Study. Uh, the third, so, so we finished the second point, and the second point, the ways of acquiring knowledge, how it takes place. You listen, you write, and then you go back, and then you do the actual acqu- acquisition of knowledge. And then there are three points that you mentioned, you know, uh, in terms of clear writing, then summarizing things, and then revising things. Uh, now we move on to the third uh, issue, which is the Sheikh says that. The student of knowledge should realize that one particular book will have many explanations. Well, for example, I mentioned that at tahawiya has many, many explanations. There are many explanations. And we see that every person who writes an explanation has his own style. Some will have, uh, you know, some will write just briefly. Uh, some will have a very technical, very detailed style. Some will mention the fundamental issues and branch off into all of the subsidiary issues and exhaust them systematically. So we see that every every explanation has its own little uh, approach. And so what the Sheikh is saying here is that what we should do is that we should take one book, we should take one book, and we should use it as the foundation. So we take one book, for example, so we're going to take Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan's book, uh, Commentary Upon at tahawiyah Right, and so he should, he should use this as the foundation. Once he's used that as the foundation, then, then he can go to other explanations, and then he can add to the foundation he's already built. So the Sheikh is saying that, you know, because we have such a, a diverse and rich amount of resources available to us, for example, the explanation of uh, the three principles, you know, Thalathatul Usul. We have many, many explanations of that. Likewise, we have the book Kashf al right? the, 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 the doubts of the, the, the grave worshippers. Right? We have many, many explanations. You know, there's countless explanations of that book. We can go on and on for all of the various other, other books that we see, Kitab al-Tawheed, Kitab al So what a person should do is find one particular book, use it as the foundation, study it thoroughly, and then move on to other, other explanations where he will see different approaches different methods, different styles of explanation, and so he will increase uh, in, in, in that way. And the Shaykh mentions a verse, وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ That uh, above everyone who has knowledge is someone who has more knowledge. And obviously at the end that refers back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the all-knowing. But even amongst the people we see, that, that among, the, amongst the people, even amongst the scholars, we see they vary in their knowledge and the types of knowledge. And so this is just... Uh, uh, an issue we should we should be aware of when it comes to studying these types of books and the various explanations and the benefit we can get from you know uh, m- using one as the foundation and then moving to others as as uh, as additional uh, knowledge.
Then we come to another benefit towards the end, and uh, the Shaykh says here that very often, the Shaykh says, when it comes to studying these types of books on the issues of Tawheed and Aqidah and Iman, we often come to, uh, we, 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 we deal with the astray groups, the astray sects. We have the Khawarij, we have the Murji'a, we have the Mu'tazila, the Ashara. These are all groups who are, are, are present and they have deviations in the field of Aqidah. And the Shaykh says that many times that when we go through a book, we find that we will, that we will be addressing some of the doubts and deviations of these people. However, the Shaykh says that often many of the students, they come to me and they say, could you direct us to the books of these people so that we can go and have a look? And the Shaykh says that this is wrong. This is very wrong. A student of knowledge, someone who is seeking knowledge, should, should never ever go out and say, right, let me go and have a look at the books of the Ash'aris. Let me go and have a look at the, look at the books of the Mu'tazila, or the books of the Khawarij, or the books of the Murji, or the books of the, the Qadriya. Let me just see what they're saying and compare it to... He says that this is wrong for a student of knowledge. And he says that even, even the scholars themselves, when the scholars themselves, when they, for example, speak about the Ash'aris or the Maturidis, or the, uh, or, or the Mu'tazila or the Jahmiya, they will be quoting through other scholars. Like they will say, for example, that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi rahimahullah, he said such and such about the uh, Ash'aira or about their doctrines. Or he said such and such about the Khawarij. Or he said such and such about whatever. And even the scholars take this approach because you know, they, they, want to, they don't want to go and uh, waste their time or subject themselves to you know, uh, uh, these kind of issues by going to the books of the Jahmiya and, and the Khawarij and the, the, the Qadriya. And the, but you see them often quoting Ibn al-Qayyim, Ibn Taymiyyah and other scholars like that. So they will refer to the, 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 the statements and the explanations and the refutations of the bona fide, trustworthy, firmly established scholars themselves and will not themselves go to these books. So how much more then for the students who are taking knowledge from them. So the point being here then is that when a person is a beginner student of knowledge, he shouldn't go around reading you know, uh, every book he picks up from every author that he comes across. Rather, he should stick to the firmly established rooted scholars and their works, gain a thorough understanding from them, and not really go out and, and try to make you know, studies of these books to see what's in there and see if he can refute them. This is, this is not the way, because many a person in history, uh, he has gone out intending to refute falsehood, and he ends up being convinced by that very same falsehood. There are many examples like this that the scholars have, have mentioned. And in fact, most of the deviations which occurred were people who were upon the, the sunnah, and then they intended to refute bid'ah, but, but because their knowledge was weak, then they got enticed by that. But this is what happened, like for example, the uh, people like the, the Ibn Qulab, these were people in the time of Imam Ahmad, they wanted to refute the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiyyah, but they themselves fell into that blameworthy kalam and they departed and deviated from the sunnah. Right? So this shows uh, that a student of knowledge should uh, try to keep his feet firmly planted and he should uh, lay down the strong foundations for his creed and for his knowledge and not to, to, to spend time going here and there and trying to you know, uh, look into these other books and these doubts and so on and so forth. <coughs> so... Uh, this is the end of the uh, advice at the beginning that the Shaykh has mentioned. He then also has another benefit uh, connected to this. And this, this generally relates to the issue of uh, the Aqidah, the Aqidah, the, the creed which a person holds, and the meaning of the word Aqidah, which means to, to, you know, to, to something to become binded and tied, you know, like a, a knot is tied. And what it means uh, what it means for our purpose here, it means that when something enters into the heart, then it firmly clings to the heart like this. It will not leave the heart. It clings and it won't leave the heart. And no doubt will make that thing, will make, or, or will make that knowledge to leave the heart. This is the meaning of aqidah. It means a knowledge which clings to your heart and which does not separate from that heart. No doubt will make that knowledge separate from that heart. This is the literal meaning. Or this is the meaning of aqidah as we use it to, to refer to the affairs of, of, of belief and the affairs of the religion. So we see that the Shaykh says, uh, that the Shaykh says here that the knowledge of aqidah is something 
which all other branches of knowledge are dependent upon. They, re- they go back to the knowledge of Aqidah. So for example, when you go back to uh, the books of Tafsir, the books of explanation of the Qur'an, then you will need knowledge of the, of the Aqidah. And you know, for, you to, uh, to, for you to see that which is... Uh, what he's speaking of here is that for you to have a good grounding and for you to go through different disciplines like Tafsir, and fiqh and so on and so forth, that all of them ultimately, ultimately they go back to issues of, of aqidah. And so if a person isn't firmly established and grounded in the aqidah, then he will likewise make mistakes in understanding Allah's speech and the speech of the Messenger in other issues as well, in tafsir, in fiqh, in, you know, in, in, in many other issues that pertain to the religion. And likewise, the aqidah itself it is something which corrects a person's action, his amal. Because his amal, his action is dependent upon the belief that he holds. So if his aqidah is sound, then everything that proceeds from him in his actions, that too will be sound. And <coughs> the shaykh then mentions how the heart, the heart is something which controls the rest of the body. And if the heart is sound, if the knowledge in the heart is sound, then all of the rest of the body will proceed in a similar manner. And this is based upon the well-known and famous hadith in which the messenger said, indeed, there is a morsel of flesh in the body, which if it is sound, then all of the body will be sound, and which if it is corrupt, then all of the body will be corrupt. Indeed, it is the heart. And Abu Huraira, radiyallahu anhu, he said, the heart is the king, and the limbs and the, 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 the limbs are the soldiers. So if the king is upright, then the soldiers likewise will be upright. And if the king errs, he makes a mistake, then the soldiers likewise will make a mistake. Right? This is the nature of the relationship between the heart the heart, and the rest of the body. So for that reason, the shaykh says here that I advise you all to have the greatest of concern with the affairs of Tawheed and Aqidah, and that you study them are reflecting upon them and that you memorize the evidences and you know because these this is the knowledge that you, that you will be in need of in all situations in every situation in the you know the affairs of the unseen you need to rely upon the affairs of Akira because they're not based upon aql you know the, the intellect and analogy and reflection all these things cannot independently arrive at knowledge of the aqidah and tawheed Right, so in all situations you will need to depend upon this uh, knowledge, and so for that reason uh, you have to give the greatest of concern uh, to this. And you know, this is this brings us to the end of this initial advice that Sheikh Salih Al Sheikh gave with respect to you know how we should treat uh, this issue of seeking knowledge, and especially when it comes to studying books uh, like these. So, inshallah ta'ala, we can then make a start then. Uh, with uh, we can make a start. We have some time, inshallah. We can make make a start then. So we begin then at the beginning of at Tahawi's Creed, and so we'll read from the book, inshallah. Ta'ala. So we see that in the text, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim the name of Allah, uh, the most merciful. Ever merciful to his servants. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All praises due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Qala al-Allamatu Hujjatul Islam Abu Ja'farin al-Warraq al-Tahawi bi-Misra. Rahimahullah. So, uh, the Allama, the proof of Islam, Abu Ja'far al-Warraq al-Tahawi, he said in, in Misr, in Egypt, whilst in Egypt, may Allah have mercy upon him. Hada ذِكْرُ بَيَانِ عَقِيدَةِ أَحْلِ سُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَاعَةِ So he begins by saying that this is a mention of the explanation of the aqidah of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'a. And then he continues عَلَى مَذْهَبِ فُقَهَاءِ الْمِلَّةِ Upon the way the madhab of the jurists of the ummah, meaning the scholars, the jurists of the ummah. And then he mentions amongst them Abi Hanifata and Nu'man ibn Thabitin al Kufi, who is Abu Hanifa and Nu'man ibn Thabitin al Kufi from Kufa, Wa Abi Yusuf 
Yaqub bin Ibrahim al-Ansari and he is the student of Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf al-Ansari wa Abi Abdullah Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani and he is another of the associates of Abu Hanifa uh, Muhammad bin al-Hasan al-Shaybani Ridwanullahi alihim ajma'in May Allah be pleased with them all. So he mentions Abu Hanifa and two of his most notable uh, uh, students. And then he says, وَمَا يَأْتَكِدُونَ مِنْ أُصُولِ الدِّينِ وَيَدِينُونَ بِهِ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ So we will mention here an explanation of the aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Then he mentions upon the madhab of the fuqaha, of the jurists, and he mentions the three of them, Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf, and Abu Abdullah Muhammad bin al Hasan al-Shaybani. And then he says, And whatever they believe regarding the foundations of the religion and by which they worship their Lord, that which they hold as their religion before the Lord of the worlds. So this is the opening passage. So here at tahawi is explained his intent. And he's explained, he's laid down here what he's going to outline in uh, the rest of the treaties. So upon this, the Shaykh, Shaykh Salih Al-Fawzan, Hafizahullah, he first of all begins his commentary by saying, uh, beginning with the mention of Allah's name, and then praising Allah, Lord of the Lord of the worlds, and sending prayers and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, and he gives us an introduction about the Aqeedah. He says, verily, the Aqeedah is the foundation of the religion. A meaning, that which we hold with the hearts in terms of the belief, belief in Allah, and belief in the angels, and the books, and the messengers, and Al-Qadr, and all of the affairs of the unseen, then all of this is the foundation of the religion. And this is the, the content, this is what comprises the shahada. And when you say the shahada, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh, then within this shahada, then it comprises all of the affairs of, of the aqidah. And the shaykh says, it is the first pillar from the pillars of Islam. The shahada is the first pillar from the pillars of Islam. And so for this reason, it is necessary that we give great concern to it, that we know what this aqidah is, and we know how this aqidah is invalidated. How does a person's aqidah become defective and invalidated? And so, so a person should give concern to it so that he becomes someone who has insight. He is upon basira. He has sure knowledge. He is upon a correct sound aqidah. Because the shaykh says that when a person's deen, when his religion is founded upon a correct foundation, upon sound aqidah, then the whole deen itself will become acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when a person's deen is established upon a defective, confused, or even a corrupt aqidah, then this deen will become invalid. It will, become, it will not be correct. And it will, be, it will be upon an incorrect foundation. And so for this reason, the shaykh says, the scholars, may Allah have mercy upon them, they show a great deal of concern to the affairs of aqidah, and you know, they, 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 uh, they narrate, they don't bring anything new, they don't, rather we see that they narrate things from those who came before them. And so this is the manner that they transmit the aqidah to the, to, to, to the, to the people. So we see from the very beginning, the sahaba, Radiallahu anhum, we see that they never had any doubt in any of the affairs of the aqidah. The Quran came to them, and whatever the sunnah, uh, whatever the messenger brought to them from the sunnah, alayhi salatu wasalam, then the aqidah was based upon those two sources. And they believed in everything, they acquired the knowledge of the unseen, the knowledge of Allah, His names and attributes, and everything else from the matters of the aqidah, and they never ever displayed any shak, any doubt. They never ever questioned anything, saying, why is this, and why is that, and why is this, and why is that. Rather, they accepted everything with qubul and taslim, with acceptance and submission. And whatever Allah said, whatever the messenger said, then they accepted it, and they never ever needed to rely upon any additional books that, were, that needed to be written. In that time, there, were no, there wasn't any books that needed to be written. There wasn't you know, a book explaining tawheed. There wasn't a book explaining Aqidah. There wasn't a book explaining Iman. There wasn't a book explaining Qadr. In that time, there was no doubt. There was no confusion. The, the truth was clear, and the Sahaba knew the truth. 
And so they worshipped Allah with that truth. And uh, there wasn't any need for any further clarifications because the truth was one. There wasn't any doubts, there wasn't any deviations. And so this situation here of the Sahaba being upon clarity was then passed on to their students. And their students were the Tabi'een. The Tabi'een. And so the Tabi'een, we see that because they took this knowledge from the Sahaba amongst the Tabi'een in general, we saw that the truth by and large was one and they were united and there wasn't any real major deviation amongst the, the bulk of the Tabi'een who were living in that time. And we are speaking, you know, uh, roughly to the year around 100 Hijra. Because the Messenger died, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then, and then after him were the Khulafa, up until 30 years after the, you know, after the, the, the passing away of the Messenger of Ali Sallallahu Alaihi And then from that time to uh, the turn of the century, 100 Hijra, in that time, those who were born in that time, they were known as the as a Tabi'een. And they took knowledge from the Sahaba. So amongst them, whilst the Sahaba were alive, there wasn't any major deviation. But when we see that the Sahaba passed away, the last of the Sahaba passed away, which was actually around 100 years after Hijrah, the last of the Sahaba, this is when we see that the sects and the deviations began to appear. And so the Shaykh mentions that there are many people who entered the religion and they weren't really firmly grounded in the Aqidah, but they entered into the religion. Or likewise, they might have entered into the religion having... having uh, devious ideas which they had from before. And because we see many people became Muslim from the Persians, from the Romans, from the, from the Jews, from the Christians, from many, from many different backgrounds, from the fire worshippers and so on and so forth. And many of them brought the, the whatever philosophy and beliefs and ideas that they might have had with them. And obviously this had an impact upon, upon the Islamic belief. And likewise the Shaykh says, likewise we saw people who were raised amongst the Muslims, but they didn't really truly understand the importance of going back to the book and to the sunnah in the affairs of Aqidah. And rather they went back to you know, other false principles. So we see that when this happened, when this began to occur, this is when really the, the sects and the deviations began to, uh, began to appear. So we had, initially at the beginning we had the Khawarij and the, 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 the Rawafid, the Rafid, the Shia, and the Murjiya and the Qadariya. And then after the turn of the century, we had more deviations entering. The Jahmiya, the Mu'tazila, and so on and so forth. So in this context and in this situation, this is when the scholars saw the necessity and the need to start authoring books, to start writing books, and to start preserving the Aqidah, and to start refuting the falsehood. And so it was in this time, and this is roughly in the time of, you know, uh, after the turn of the first century in the time of Al-Hasan al-Basri Rahimahullah, he died in the year 110 Hijra and likewise uh, Imam al-Zuhri he died in the year 124 Hijra Muhammad bin Sirin died 110 Hijra and around the time that the, that the first Imam Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah was alive and he met many of the, the Tabi'een so in this time we saw that this was a time when uh, the, the, the scholars from the Tabi'een began to speak and some of them began to even author works. Um, and so we see that when this happened over the next 100 or so years, 100 to, 100 to 150 years, in the time that Abu Hanifa was present, Rahimahullah, and Imam Malik was present, Rahimahullah, then Imam Ash-Shafi, Rahimahullah, then, uh, then Imam Ahmed, that period of 150 years, we saw a great deal of effort from the scholars of Islam in Refuting the people who of innovation, authoring works in compiling the ahadith, likewise compiling the narrations to write down the tafsir of the Quran. Right, so we see all these different areas, you know, uh, taking place, and through all of that activity, through all of that activity, we see that the religion, from all different aspects, in terms of its aqidah, in terms of the the ahkam, in terms of the, uh, the akhlaq and the morals and so forth, in terms of the hadith themselves, in terms of the tafsir, we see all of this activity taking place, which is essentially preserving the religion, and the most important part of which is the, is the aqidah. So in this time, if, you know, there, are, there are many, many books that were written by the scholars, and uh, these books they would call as-sunnah, or al-iman, 
or Ash-Sharia. There are many, many scores and scores and scores of books that we could mention that were written in this time. And they cover different fields, fields of Allah's names and attributes, the, the, the topic of Al-Qadr, uh, the topic of the Iman of a believer, you know, as it pertains to major sins and so on and so forth. In all these areas we see these issues being written about and spoken about and the scholars you know, refuting that which opposes it. So what we see and what we gather from this, as the Shaykh says, that we see that all of, all of the four Imams, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam, uh, Imam Ahmad, all of them were united upon a single creed and all of them and their followers likewise were involved in defending this creed. And uh, so the Shaykh then goes on to mention some notable names and some scholars like Ishaq ibn Rahuya, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, Imam Muslim, all of these are from the 3rd century. And likewise, Imam ibn Khuzayma from the, four, from, from the 3rd and 4th century. And likewise, ibn Qutayba. And likewise, Imam al-Tabari who wrote the tafsir al-Tabari. And likewise, from the later times, Imam al-Baghawi, ibn Kathir. These are all scholars from the later times. But the point being here the Shaykh is making is that all of these scholars, they actually wrote books. They wrote books. And we, many of these books, they were given certain names like As-Sunnah or As-Sharia or Al-Iman or Al-I'tiqad. All of these different names, the intent is the same, which is to lay down the belief and the creed of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And so from those people, coming now to our, to our, to our issue, to our, to our topic, from those people was Imam al-Tahawi. Imam al-Tahawi rahimahullah. So as we said, he died in the year 321 Hijrah. He was in Egypt. We mentioned these details at the beginning of his uh, biography. And so he authored this work. It's a very brief work. Maybe it consists of maybe 150 sentences. We can fit it onto maybe six, seven pages. And those sentences are very concise, very brief. And the Shaykh says there are many explanations which have been given of this book. And he mentioned Ibn Abil Iz that we mentioned earlier on. He mentions that this is uh, from the most comprehensive of them and the most sound of them because there are other explanations written by the people of innovation and the people who are upon other, other ways and other approaches. And so here the Shaykh says that he mentioned the creed of Abu Hanifa and the creed of Abu Yusuf and the creed of Muhammad al-Shaybani. But this is also the creed of the rest of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. It isn't just exclusive to them, because as we mentioned, the creed of the four Imams is one and the same. And so, apart from maybe a few little issues, inshallah ta'ala, that we will discuss at the appropriate point, but on the whole, in the majority of the affairs, then they are united upon uh, this Aqidah, and they took this Aqidah from the book and the Sunnah, and not from the principles of Kalam, you know, the, theological rhetoric or the principles of logic or other things like that. Rather, they had a single source. And the Sheikh says, unfortunately, many of the later followers of the four Imams, from the later followers, so those who came much after Imam Abu Hanifa. In fact, there were even people at the time of Abu Hanifa who, you know, were upon the way of the Mu'tazila. But generally, those who came much after the Imams, <coughs> we see that they began to follow some of the other deviated ways of kalam and mantik of logic and philosophy and and you know uh, so on and so forth but this happened with abu hanifa and many of his followers they took the way of the mu'tazila it happened with imam malik likewise it happened with imam shafi likewise many of the followers of imam shafi who followed the fiqh of imam shafi they actually are ash'aris they're ash'aris and so <clears throat> and even from the followers of imam ahmed there was some from the 5th century, who again, they got influenced by something of the ilmul kalam, like the theological rhetoric, whatever, and they got influenced to it. However, what we see historically is that the followers of Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, that they were the least affected, right? So the, the amount of deviation in the followers of Imam Ahmad is the least compared to all the followers of all of the other Imams, compared to the the Hanafis, the Malikis, the Shafis, and we see that amongst those people, such a deviation, in fact, great deviation, that we never see amongst the, 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 the Hanbalis. And this is, as the scholars explain, the reason for this is because Imam Ahmad, uh, because of Imam Ahmad and his adherence to the truth, and that, you know, his, his, his uh, defense of the truth, and in most of the affairs of the religion, you know, he, he was given, basically, Allah made him to be the Imam of Ahl-Sunnati wal-Jama'ah. 
And so most of the truth came to be in his views and in his positions. But anyway, the point being here that at tahawi has mentioned the creed as Abu Hanifa was upon it and Abu Yusuf was upon it and as Muhammad Ashibani were upon it. And it is different to what the later people claim is Abu Hanifa's creed. Because the later people who came, they began to write books. And in those books, they mixed things of kalam and mantik and whatever. And then they ascribed it to Abu Hanifa. And this is not the case with what is in the creed of Imam al-Tahawi. So, um, with this then, the Shaykh, after making this point, the Shaykh then goes on to begin uh, the first statement of Imam al-Tahawi, rahimahullah, نَقُولُ فِي تَوْحِيدِ اللَّهِ مُعْتَقِدِينَ بِتَوْفِيقِ اللَّهِ That we say regarding the Tawheed of Allah, believing by Allah's success, that indeed, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَاحِدٌ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ That indeed, Allah is one, there is no partner to Him. And so, inshallah ta'ala, we will leave the explanation of this to the second lesson. And with that, we conclude uh, today's lesson. So it was just really an introduction, inshallah ta'ala. We will get into uh, the content and the first statement of at tahawi rahimahullah, in the next lesson next week, inshallah ta'ala. Any questions on what's been said? We have a few minutes for that, inshallah. Otherwise, we'll conclude the lesson there. Imam al Tahawi died in 321 Hijrah. 321. He was born in 239. Some scholars say 238. Yeah. 239. He died in 321 Hijrah. So he lived for almost 90 years. MashaAllah. 90 years. That's the statement of Abu, Abu yeah. yeah. He said that, um, that indeed, are, yeah. That's at the end. Yeah, he said that indeed, uh, the heart is the king and the limbs are the soldiers. The heart is the king and the limbs are the soldiers. And if the king is upright and steadfast, then the soldiers will be upright and steadfast. And if the king errs and makes a mistake, then the soldiers will err and make a mistake. Basically, the soldiers follow whatever the king is upon. Or whatever the king is upon, the soldiers will always uh, follow that. Inshallah, we'll close the lesson here today then. We'll continue next week, inshallah ta'ala, at the same time. 5.30, 5.45. Okay. Yeah, okay. around the same time. After Maghrib, maybe about half an hour after Maghrib, inshallah ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha 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 ila